The Eve of St. Mark. A fragment by John Keats Upon a Sabbath day it fell. Twice holy was the Sabbath bell that called the folk to evening prayer. The city streets were clean and fair from wholesome drench of April rains. And, on the western window panes, the chilly sunset faintly told of unmatured green valleys cold, of the green thorny bloomless hedge, of rivers new with spring tide sedge, of primroses by sheltered rills, and daisies on the aguiche hills. Twice holy was the Sabbath bell. The silent streets were crowded well with staid and pious companies, warm from their fireside oratries, and moving with demurest air to even song and vesper prayer. Each arched porch and entry. Low was filled with patient folk and slow, with whispers hush, and shuffling feet, while played the organ loud and sweet. The bells had ceased, the prayers begun, and Bertha had not yet half done a curious volume, patched and torn, that all day long, from earliest morn, had taken captive her two eyes among its golden broideries, perplexed her with a thousand things, the stars of heaven, and angels' wings, martyrs in a fiery blaze, azure saints in silver rays, Moses's breastplate, and the seven candlesticks John saw in heaven, the winged lion of Saint Mark, and the covenantal ark with its many mysteries, cherubim and golden mice. Bertha was a maiden fair, dwelling in the old Minster Square. From her fireside she could see sidelong its rich antiquity, far as the bishop's garden wall, where sycamores and elm trees tall, full-leaved, the forest had outstripped, by no sharp north wind ever nipt, so sheltered by the mighty pile. Bertha rose, and read a while with forehead, gainst the window pane, again she treed, and then again, until the dusk eve left her dark upon the legend of St. Mark. From plated lawn frill, fine and thin, she lifted up her soft warm chin, with aching neck and swimming eyes, and dazed with saintly imageries. All was gloom, and silent all, save now and then the still footfall of one. Returning homewards late past the echoing minster gate, the clamorous daws, that all the day above treetops and towers play, pair by pair had gone to rest, each in its ancient belfry nest where asleep they fall betimes to music of the drowsy chimes. All was silent, all was gloom abroad and in the homely room. Down she sat, poor, cheated soul, and struck a lamp from the dismal coal, leaned forward with bright drooping hair and slant book full against the glare. Her shadow, in uneasy guise, hovered about, a giant size, on ceiling beam and old oak chair, the parrot's cage, and panel square and the warm angled winter screen, on which were many monsters seen, called doves of Siam, lima mice, and legless birds of paradise, macaw, and tender avadavat, and silken furred angora cat. Untired she read, her shadow still glowered about as it would fill the room with wildest forms and shades, as though some ghostly queen of spades had come to mock behind her back, and dance, and ruffle her garments black. Untired she read the legend page of Holy Mark, from youth to age, on land, on sea, in pagan chains, rejoicing for his many pains. Sometimes the learned Aramite with golden star, or dagger bright, referred to pious poesies written in smallest crowquill size beneath the text, and thus the rhyme was parceled out from time to time, Al's. Writeth he of Swephanes, men han beforn they wake in bliss, Wan a that here friendes think him bound in crimped shroud far underground a, and how a littling child mote be a saint er its nativity, gift that the madra, God her blesse, kepin in solitariness, and kissen devout the holy croce, of goddess love, and Satan's force, he, writeth, and things many mo of switch things I may not show. But I must tell in verily somdel of Saint Cecily, and chief see what he octor thee of Saint Marcus life and deethy. At length her constant eyelids come upon the fervent martyrdom. Then lastly to his holy shrine, exalt amid the tapers shine at Venice.